Welcome and thank you for, for joining us for Real Talk on Youth Homelessness with guest speaker Charlotte Smith. If this is your first Amplify session, thank you so much for joining us today. If you attended a session earlier today and are with us again, great to have you back. My name is Mohammed. I'm a, the Director of Community Initiatives at United Ways Ontario. I'll be your host for today. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to note that we, United Way East Ontario, acknowledge that our offices located here in Ottawa region are on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. Each and every day, we are grateful to live, work, and play on this land. While I have the opportunity, let me run through some of the tech items so you'll be comfortable navigating the platform this afternoon. You can use the raise hand button function at any point to get the attention of our Gen Next team. Should you have any questions for Charlotte, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Questions can be submitted at any point during the event, but please keep in mind the language and dialogue appropriate, keep the language and dialogue appropriate and respectful. We have some wonderful moderators keeping an eye for your messages they will also drop in, drop any relevant links in the chat for you today. We're all gathered here today, thanks to our event sponsor, Tech Savvy, who made Gen Next Amplify possible. Thank you for your continued support, Tech Savvy. If you're looking for better internet ser service, a, ne a necessity in our current climate, our handy moderators will be posting a link in the chat for you to learn more. Today, we're also here to celebrate the launch of Gen Next East Ontario, formerly known as Gen Next Ottawa. This year, we officially became Gen Next East Ontario and now work with communities across Prescott Russell, Ottawa, Lanark, and Refru counties. Gen Next EO is a social impact movement for people who want to learn about the unique challenges facing our region and create meaningful local change. Gen Next is all about bringing people together through fun, through philanthropy and fun. To learn more, visit the brand new website and sign up for the newsletter filled with stories of local love, event invites like this, volunteer opportunities and more. Please visit us at gennexteo.ca and our moderators will be popping that into the chat right now for you. The ticket proceeds from Amplify are going back into our communities in support of Gen Next East Ontario's causes, mental health, youth homelessness, equitable employment, and diversity and inclusion. Thanks to your support, vulnerable members of our communities are getting the support they need in the ways they need it. Ongoing donations, even in small amounts, provide Gen Next East Ontario with reliable funds to fuel lasting change in our region. That's why they created Gen Next Plus. We've got one of our moderators entering the link into the chat for you right now. If you're interested in joining this group of monthly donors, it comes with great perks like discount on events like this. As the Director of Community Initiatives at United Ways Ontario, I've witnessed firsthand the increased demand for housing and support for the most vulnerable youth during the pandemic. COVID-19 has made it harder for young people to meet their basic needs. Without access to housing, youth are incapable of self-isolating, putting themselves and others at greater risk of contracting the virus. It also means youth experience even more barriers to finding safe housing. For example, it's more unlikely that someone who would lend their couch to a young person in need due to, health, due to health concerns. This makes things particularly difficult for youth in rural communities who often turn to couch surfing when they don't have a safe place to stay. Shelters and congregate living settings are at increased risk of outbreaks and many shared housing options have strict rules that result in informal evictions. At Gen Nexus Ontario, we believe that everyone deserves to have to find a safe place to call home. 
We are working with our community partners to provide homeless youth with much needed essentials like food and PPE. And we're bridging the technology gap, gap so youth can stay connected to their support systems. No young person in our community should choose to be, no young person chooses to be homeless. But many factors drive youth to leave home like family rejection, violence, and abuse. Youth who experience homelessness often struggle with mental health and substance use challenges that can make it even harder to transition into stable, independent living. Youth homelessness is, not, is, is a new cause for Gen X, but it has always been an important cause, important issue for United Way East Ontario. We know it's a cause you care about, and that's why we've included for Gen X EO. So when you support Gen X, you can help youth homeless. You can help it. You can help end youth homelessness before it becomes a lifelong. Before it becomes lifelong, but it's a complex issue, which is why I'm glad we're bringing in front. We're bringing it in front and center as part of Amplify. We're here to talk about the unique challenges facing our region and what you can do to make a meaningful, lasting impact. Here to help us, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Charlotte Smith. Welcome, Charlotte. Thanks, Mohammed, and thanks so much for United Way to the invite. I've always enjoyed working with the individuals at the, the Ottawa branch of United Way. And That's great. And, and and Charlotte, and let me give a quick introduction to Charlotte before you go on, Charlotte. Just sure, sorry. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just so the audience knows who you, knows who you are. Charlotte is a, a known quantity in our community. She's a researcher in this field and is deeply passionate about transforming her own experience of homelessness and addiction into tools for public awareness and community building. This is why we've asked, her, we've asked her to join us today. She is a master's of sociology student, advocate and co-founder of the Making the Shift Scholars with Lived Experience Network, a network of scholars who have experienced youth homelessness. Charlotte is also the founder of LibreX Alliance, a grassroots peer support group for adults and youth with lived experience of homelessness. Together, they support and advocate for homeless youth in Ottawa. As Charlotte mentioned, she has worked closely with United Way and our staff for the last few years. We've been very lucky uh, to have worked with Charlotte. Charlotte, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. I, I'm, I'm uh, moderating today's session uh, with Charlotte, and the topic and it's, the topic is real talk on youth homelessness. Uh, we recognize this is a, a challenging and, and sometimes triggering conversation for for folks, uh, but it's a, an important uh, work that we have to all do. Um, Charlotte, I'll, I'll start off um, just as a happening in our community, something that's happening every day in our community. Um, on one night in February, there were two thousand people who access emergency shelter in Ottawa. What, what do you think is standing in, in our way of ending homelessness in our communities? I mean, I think it's been said so many times before, but I think the first and foremost, what's stopping us is, is a real understanding of what causes homelessness and what perpetuates and maintains it. And I think instead of realizing all these large scale structural forces that people experience and that shape our lives, you know, we often turn to victim blaming, right? And it's, I'm not, you know, pointing fingers and blaming, oh, you're a victim blamer, you're a victim blamer. It's something that we all do, including me, even as somebody who struggles with mental health and substance use disorder and has been homeless. I still, and there's still moments of frustration and anger where I, I misunderstand what's going on, or I'm just, you know, I think um, the speaker before me said it uh, really well, uh, Nathan Hall, he said, culture is everything, right? And we live in a capitalist culture where we value things like employment and you know things like mental health aren't even on our radar and we these things are ingrained in us uh for, you know from we're very young you know starting off with our school-based experiences right and being put in a system that measures us against our peers and where when we fail in those environments we're told it's our fault right we didn't study hard enough we didn't try hard enough we didn't we weren't paying attention without acknowledging all the things that we're experiencing that might be preventing us from paying attention, from succeeding, from doing well in school and from doing well in life. Um, yeah, victim blaming. 
Yeah, I know that this is, um, so there's the, obviously the personal part and, 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 and societal challenges, but you know, th there are, this is an issue that hasn't had uh, advocacy. People like you are, are always in front of it. And there, there are other uh, individuals in our community who have been at it for so long. So in your opinion, what is the first thing that people need to do in order to address this? Is it a, a policy issue? Um, is it a, a systems issue? Um, what should be our first focus as a community? I think that this problem has gone on for so long. And while youth homelessness may have only just been started getting talked about in the last couple of decades, homelessness has been an issue, uh, you know, for as, as long as we all can remember, right? And for before we were even born. Um, so what needs to happen now, I think, is every answer to this is problematic because we live in a culture of scarcity, right? A scarcity of resources, scarcity of capital. So we need to um, divert resources to one thing whilst neglecting another. So if we're talking about youth homelessness, what we're really talking about often is pulling resources that are going to adults and redirecting them to youth. Um, sorry, I lost my, what was the actual question? So, so in, I mean- Oh, what needs to start first? Yeah, everything. Yeah, policy oh, systems. So Too many people have died now. We can't, it's not a case of like, what, what, what step do we take first? It's like, there are so many issues. They all need to be addressed right now and it's gone on, it's it's gone on for too long it's gone on for too long for example uh, you know prisons we know that prisons are not reducing crime we know that people are are coming out of prisons and being discharged into homelessness right like let's address that at the same time we want to maybe think about expanding community housing like government supported housing but we have to also acknowledge that the government supported housing that we have now is actually killing people right it's actually warehousing people in buildings and communities that are failing, not because of the individuals who are there, but because of the environments that they are forced to live in there, full of insects in uh, you know under maintained conditions without other supports that a person needs to sustain their exit from homelessness, right? Which housing is only one of those things that we need. You know, it's interesting because we, we are talking about uh, youth homelessness. The, the, the reality comes down to it is, it's, it's uh, barriers and challenges are integrated into our entire system. Um, schooling, housing, um, you know, how opportunities, uh, support services and so on. So you're, you're absolutely right. And thank you for, for connecting the dot on that. It, it, it's, 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 it's a people issue as much as it is a, a policy issue where sometimes we don't have the mindset uh, or the courage to, to, to understand our community and act. Now, Charlotte, you've been in the community um, the past year has been challenging um, for our, our for the world, but but in particular, it's been challenging for young people who are facing homelessness. Um, and we know the pandemic has exacerbated many social issues that were already uh, pressing for for many people, like you, you mentioned. How has COVID nineteen affected youth experiencing homelessness? Well, most of the youth that I, I deal with on a regular basis are. Are recently housed, but also because of the nature of exiting homelessness, oftentimes they'll they'll fall back into homelessness and back and then back into periods of stable housing and then back out. Um, but I've seen, you know, the pandemic has had, you know, it's been really tough on all of these youth, and they obviously were struggling with a, a hell of a lot of things before the pandemic, and the pandemic has only made those things worse. But I think what it's also done at like a core level, um, it's kind of shown them once again that people don't care, right? And by, you know, I just mean people in general, obviously some of us do care, but even when we say we care, we're not always showing it, right? And, you know, we've seen the government step up and really work to help people who are struggling, but at the same time, we haven't, we've seen youth confused about what they're eligible for and what they aren't, worried about facing punishment for accessing things like CERB that they needed to survive, but now they might be penalized for. Um, and we've seen people taking care of themselves before others too. I mean, we've seen great acts of kindness, but we've also seen, you know, empty shells, right? No formula, no diapers, things like that, that youth need and that they can't afford to stock up on. Yeah, I know it, it certainly has, you know, um, one thing we are seeing is that people who uh, were already uh, marginalized are, are, are greatly impacted uh, or disproportionately impacted by, by, by the pandemic. Uh, and you're right, while our community's response has been 
uh, great in so, so many ways. There are still gaps as they have existed uh, before COVID. And it, it does, you know, highlight COVID does um, show or amplify the, the disproportionality that exists in our community. And this is a space that we, you know, I hope we can do something about. Charlotte, there has been a lot of talk about uh, emergency response, um, housing supports, housing and supporting youth experiencing homelessness um, in the community over the past few years. What about preventing the issue before it even begins? What would that look like in, in, in your mind and, and in your experience? Yeah, I think prevention is so important, but then as it, like as other things, it's often talked about in a terms of like, oh, we need to switch from providing emergency supports uh, to providing prevention. And it's like, no, we need to do both um, until until we figure this out. But to me, education uh, prevention would have a lot to do with education, starting in schools, starting really young. Um, the young people that I worked with, they report, you know, first experiences of homelessness around the ages of 13, 12 or 13, you know, well, we wouldn't expect that, right? A lot of how we respond to issues goes on like the, you know, our common sense, the way we generally perceive things and the way the way it makes sense in our heads, right? It doesn't make sense to us, really. It's kind of hard to comprehend that in Canada, uh, an 11 year old would have experienced homelessness while they're living with their family, right? Well, well you know, and but it's true. Right, so we need to start, I think, um, working on prevention really, really early and working on education from day one, from kindergarten, uh, you know, everyone should know that homelessness is something that can happen to anyone and that does happen to anyone. And everyone should have an understanding that to be compassionate towards children, youth, families, newcomers, uh, LGBTQ2 plus S youth, um, indigenous peoples that this is happening to. And right now that's not the case. No, it, it, it certainly, um, you know, uh, highlights that impo the importance of, of uh, putting uh, more effort in, in, in the prevention piece. Th this is, um, you know, we, we, we have, have more accustomed to or, or, or have sort of uh, experienced the adult homelessness um, as a particular challenge. Um, when we talk about youth homelessness, um, why is it critical that we use approaches for young people that are different than the approaches we use for adults? Um, what needs to be different in, in, in youth homelessness? And, and, and can you think of why it's important to focus on youth homelessness as a distinct and, and, and particular uh, need and, and, and that also you know, our efforts should be different in, in how we approach this? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, like we assume that adults are because uh, adult homelessness has been an issue for so long that the supports and services we have for adults are well established and working and they're not right there's a there's a huge amount of like barriers to accessing services, you know, requirements that people don't necessarily meet, as well as just general stigma that prevents people from reaching out for help. Um, and then obviously we have far less services dedicated to youth than to adults, which means we have an overflow of youth accessing adult services that aren't designed for them. Um, and they really need to be not just designed with youth in mind, but designed by consulting with young people, right? I don't necessarily know as somebody who experienced homelessness 15 years ago, what young people are needing right now, but I think from, you know, Right from the start, we need to be consulting with young people and designing services in a way that they're telling us they need. For one thing, from uh, racialized young people, as well as uh, young people who identify as LGBTQ plus S, um, they're saying things like, that, you know, there aren't services that are designed with them in mind. And not only that, when they reach out and access youth services uh, that are, are aimed at them, they're not seeing themselves reflected in the staff who are providing those services. And that's that's really disappointing, right? Like it really matters to us that our environment reflects ourselves as well, you know, to feel included and like we belong. Yeah, you know, this is an issue that has uh, not only come back uh, uh, around with homelessness, but across um, support services uh, for young people, particularly um, the, the two groups you just identified. So, I mean, in, in are, are there things that are really, over the 15 years, so you've been at this, not only as, as someone with lived experience who's gone through the process um, herself, but also now as a researcher, as an advocate, um, as someone who keeps an eye on the happenings um, in our community, uh, both here locally and nationally. 
the, the system level and, and, and policy piece, what is the, what is the, 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 the temperature there? Is, is there? is there a sense of urgency to, to look at this from a system wide and, and, and have uh, a sense of urgency to, to start addressing youth homelessness? How, how are you feeling about that process? I'm feeling like in the sector, like we have a culture of talking in terms of urgency, right? And like saying like this needs to, we're all working to end homelessness as soon as possible. But in reality, our, I don't think our actions match what we're saying, including mine, right? Like I talk about ending homelessness, but like really I don't know how to do it. And I can tell that, you know, even though the talk is good, the walk isn't, right? You know, and we're not making change fast enough. And we're not putting our money where our mouths are. Yeah, that, that, I mean, after all those years, I, you know, um, and, and you're someone who's closer to the issue than many uh, people in our community. Um, and so that's tough to hear. Um, now, many of us here today, so the people attending this event today um, are here because they want to make a difference in, in, in their community. Um, but to someone who isn't educated on the issue and, and based on what you um, just said uh, in terms of uh, how as, as, as a society and as a community and even as individuals, how we're approaching this issue, the challenge of ending homelessness uh, might seem overwhelming. Um, what would you say to, to uh, our event att attendees here today about how they can get involved in moving uh, this issue forward? Yeah, I mean, as somebody who's been thinking about this for the past 15 years, it, it's still overwhelming to imagine solving this issue. Um, but what I think each of us can do is look at where are we in relation to this issue? And I think we're all playing a part in it, right? Like homelessness isn't just about housing. It's about obviously mental health. It's about su sometimes about substance use. But more than that, it's about, you know, things like colonialism, capitalism, racism, and, you know, um, poverty, we need to be addressing those things. And all of us have a connection to one of these issues, right? So I think we can each of us look at what is my connection and how can I adjust my life even just a little bit to counteract this, you know? Um, whether that's, you know, not voting for people who are contributing to any one of these issues, um, you know, or in our, in our work, um, you know, be advocating from within our workplace. Maybe our maybe our employer is playing a part in these, you know, and it's very easy to become complacent in all of these issues because we don't want to rock the boat or we want to keep benefiting uh, from 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 certain organizations, people and groups without, you know, causing a fuss. We don't want to bite the hand that feeds us. But, you know, somebody's getting bitten because we're willing to take that. Absolutely. You know, this is this raises um... Uh, an interesting point because we we um, I I think the first thing that comes to mind is um, you know inform yourself uh, about the issue. Um, we, there is a lot of care. We're, we're a community that cares about each other, um, but sometimes we we don't have the time or the opportunity to inform ourselves. And then I'm glad we're having this this type of conversation and, and hear from people like you who um, have so much to say in terms of you know. Of course, there are things that are going right, um, and, and you brought that up. There has been some some programming and supports available, but we're still overwhelmed, and we don't know um, how we we we, we can um, end youth homelessness or how you know have at least a pathway to end that. Um, I mean, like substance use is like such a huge issue, and we haven't addressed it for so many years. And you know, like. I've had youth even in the last couple of weeks calling me because they're they're saying they're ready to go to rehab. They're ready to go to detox and I can't get them in, right? There's one detox center in Ottawa and it's not like there's not there's not just a specific youth detox center. So already young people are kind of weary of going. They don't want to be necessarily in a space where there's all these adults um, as well as, you know, it's so scary when you're ready to finally ask for help, when you're struggling with substance use, I know this from experience, it is such a scary thought. It's so scary to take that step and then to commit to being, you know, locked up basically for seven days. And sure, you can leave if you really want to, but then that in itself is scary because then you're admitting defeat, right? And going back out into a life that you're struggling to survive every day. You know, why is it that I have to try so hard to call every hour to get a youth into, into a detox center that isn't necessarily going to be able to help them, that they're not going to feel comfortable in, that they're going to run away from? 
you know? And then even if I can get them into a detox center, they're gonna leave that center and have nowhere to go. Right. And then just be right back. They've got great, you've been you've managed to be sober for seven days and now I'm just gonna toss you back out to fend for yourself in an environment that is not is not capable of allowing for you to succeed. I, I, I mean, I hear you. You know, it's, it's very challenging. Um, once you have that one negative experience um, in, in the system, in the support system, that, that might just turn you away for, for good. Um, that too, yeah, exa exactly that. Yeah, when you finally are ready to reach out for help and it's not there, it's just like a smack in the face. All your confidence is gone. You were ready. That took a lot of courage for you even to admit that maybe you could go tomorrow without drugs. Maybe I could, maybe I could survive a day. You reach out for help, it's not there. Oh, you're gonna to have to wait a day. You're gonna to have to wait an hour. Yeah, you know, this, this you know, Charlie, you raised very good points, and and I hope we're we're, we're taking notes. And, and this is a, a a beginning stage, not not a beginning stage, but for a way for us to reaffirm our commitment to to our community, and particularly for people who who need our support. Um, and and you know, it it, it comes to you know, I, as I listen to you, I'm. I'm I'm also I'm cautious to ask you the next question, but I want I wanted to ask the full letter word, because as as you've been um, through the community and, and you know you had the uh, the option of uh, leaving uh, yeah, after after you got through the you know you got you got your own stable housing and had opportunity to go to school and 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 work in the greater community, but you you stuck around, you, you stayed in on the issue, you you kept up, you put pressure on people. Um, you brought your colleagues together. You organized, um, and I think that that's that's commendable. That that's something that many of us don't have the courage or the, or the uh, the vision to do. But you, you you've done that. So I wanted to thank you for that. Uh, but I, as I ask, I, I also want to ask you about hope. And and you know what what is your hope for the, for the future as as you see yourself uh, uh, doing this work and and uh, speaking out and and engaging people and. Um, trying to get support for young people. I mean, what is your hope for for us? We we are at this pandemic uh, period where we've learned so much about the the, the real challenges in our community have been really amplified, and, and there's time for us to do to do more, perhaps. Um, but what, but I want to know what what you know that full letter word. Um, where 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 are your hopes and for the future? I mean, what I really hope is that one day we have a society where. Homelessness, I think, will always be a thing because it's like, like mistakes, and not only mistakes but conflict. You know, uh, confrontation uh, is is like a, is, is human nature, right? It's part of our, it's part of us. And there'll be times where uh, somebody is kicked out of their house, right? But my hope is that an instance of homelessness would be very short. It would be like three days before you're rehoused. That it, you be able to that young people will be able to look back and say, "Oh yeah, that happened to me," and it wouldn't be stigmatized, and it would be a normal, you know, it would just be a normal accepted thing that, "Oh yeah, you know, my family couldn't cope with me at that time. I got kicked out, you know, it was three days, you know, then I got stable housing, and it didn't, it didn't determine my life outcomes. It didn't be, have to become my identity. It didn't, you know, I didn't die because of it." Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charlie, thank you so much. I mean, it, it, it's it's really. Um, I'm grateful that I've, I was able to moderate the session, and, and I, I'm sure our, our, I think these are are uh, learning as, as they hear, listen to you, and, and, and as you share with us. Um, so, Charlotte, I want to thank you so much. I, I think um, everyone here can walk away feeling uh, like they've gained uh, some insight into or better understanding of the issues and the root causes surrounding it. Um, we are uh, going to. Um, um, taking a few questions from the audience and uh, a reminder that if you have questions you can submit them um, at any time on the QA Q a button at the bottom of your, of your screen. Uh, Charlotte, let me just uh, perhaps ask uh, a question from from our audience. The, um, what do you think is the biggest barrier that exists in Ottawa to ensuring youth have the tools they need to break the cycle of homelessness? I mean, I think it's just like, we need like holistic approaches to solving homelessness. Like young people don't have the mental health supports they need, right? And it's really sad when you, when you try to look up mental health supports for people and you can see that it's like a tiered system where, you know, the, 
even if you can go on a wait list for free supports, they're going to be kind of like the lowest of the barrel, like the least bells and whistles, your most kind of basic supports. And then you keep looking into it and you can see all these really specialized uh, forms of therapy, really innovative, you know, really exploratory, um, you know, really kind of geared towards the individual, you know, and, and those are completely out of reach, right? These are like four, like four money services that most people can't access, you know? Um, there's a two year waiting list for, for some services, uh, not just for youth, for all people in mental health. And like, you don't have two years to wait. You know, and by the end, in, in, it becomes this issue, like one huge barrier for youth is that people think that they don't care and that they don't want help, but you haven't seen how many times that they have tried to access help and been refused or rejected or actually received that support and it wasn't right for them, which like you said, Mohammed, like takes down your, your uh, the likelihood that you're going to ask for that support again, right? Yeah. And why it wasn't right for them a lot of times is because it's like super clinical and super rushed, you know? Maybe you're getting half an hour with 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 a professional, you know, in, the, in in half an hour, it doesn't you don't even get time to establish trust. You don't get to feel as if this person really cares for you. And I mean, it's not the individual's fault. It's the whole system. Right. It's this kind of like factory style of, of supporting people on this conveyor belt, you know, that has to be very regimented. And that's just not doesn't make sense. Like that's not how people actually get help, you know, in real terms. It help is flexible. It You know, it it changes based on your how you wake up that day and what you're feeling you what you can accept and what you can and what you're ready for and what you want you know yeah. what you can cope with and 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 they, yeah that's a huge barrier absolutely thanks Ra. The, there is a question about um uh, rural youth uh so we know that rural youth experience homelessness often uh, come to the city um is there something the community can do to better address this reality for youth in rural regions? Well, I mean, the reason I think from the youth that I know, a lot of the reason uh, youth come to the city is because there's no ser service in services in rural areas, right? And part of the reason for that is that um, a lot of uh, white, older, middle class people in rural areas don't want to believe that this is happening in their area. And, and, and lo and behold, they make that true. It's not happening in your area because you're not willing to respond to it in your area. So, so young people are having to move into cities to access services where they're displaced from their families, displaced from any kind of uh, informal support network that they did have going there. And, you know, and usually what I see is young people, you know, having to end up struggling with all kinds of issues they didn't have before because they've been placed into this urban setting where everybody who's struggling is just funneled into these very, you know, uh, tight areas where, you know, it's not that you're not surrounded by good people, you know, it's just like anything there, when you're on the streets, there are good people, there are bad people and everything in between, but it's that you're all drowning and nobody can help each other up. And, and all you can do is teach people your ways of coping. You know, my way of coping when I was on the streets was to to uh, use uh, use drugs and substances. And I did that because I just couldn't cope with my mental health and the reality of my childhood and all these things. But you know what? That's definitely a coping mechanism that I pass on to other people. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for that. There are questions popping up uh, in, in the q and I'll take, you know, a few more. Um, here, a question from uh, Oliver Jacob. How can municipalities better support young, um, young homeless population? I think schools could do a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm biased, right? Because my research is about school-based experiences, but I think that, and you know what, like everything's so complicated. I don't know the answers to how to end homelessness because there are so many different parts of it. And like, you know, including like government, economy. I, I don't even know how to explain the economy. Who does? I, I haven't ever met anyone who could explain that, right? So it's really hard when people ask me like what municipalities can do or things like that, because I don't know what the power of a municipality is, right? Um, and I actually don't think that they have any power over schools, but to me, uh, schools being connected with local resources would be a really great thing. I don't know what municipalities can do there, um, but making sure that there's this kind of partnership where, for example, uh, if young person is struggling with housing or mental health, uh, they're not only just handed a phone number in a school, but they're actually like, like their hand is held in getting to this service by somebody that they trust. 
And a lot of times that is not the uh, school guidance counselor or the school social worker, right? So I think we really need to spend time building trust with young people so that when they need help, they are willing to go with somebody to get that help, which is not the case right now. And one thing I think that uh, one hopeful thing I could think of maybe for that is the idea of peer support, right? Is trusting other young people to help other young people and providing young people the tools to be able to support and help their friends. Yeah. And kind of just relinquishing that power, right? It's not just that we don't believe young people can help other young people. It's the, it's the thought that no, we're, we know more. Maybe they can help, but we're, at, we're adults, we know more, you know, uh, we're the professionals, so we're gonna do it. And we're just cutting off our nose to spite our face. And also, yeah, I think so we enjoy the about, Yeah, let, let, let me, let's continue there a little bit. Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, Lived uh, X Alliance? Um, yeah, the LibX Alliance, I'm just the co-founder of it. So it came out of, in all my discussions, I've interviewed about 45 young people uh, about their homelessness, particularly about their school-based experiences. And that was because of a grant I received from Carleton University, as well as a research project that United Way partnered with me with, which was, uh, which was so great. Um, and every time I've met a young person, since the first since I first started doing research, I've always said you're welcome to stay in touch with me if you want as a peer, because I didn't like the approach of just interviewing them and then okay I never see you again here's 20 bucks you've told me all these kinds of uh, intimate details about your life and you're never going to see me again. What happened is a bunch of young people have stayed in touch with me, as well as I've met more um, adults with lived experience of homelessness through public speaking events like with United Way or other conferences. And we've, we've kind of built this organic community, which we now refer to as the LiveX Alliance. Um, so it's a group of adults and youth with lived experience of homelessness, as well as adults and young people who don't have lived experience, but who are allies and who want to help. Um, so really what solidified this group was uh, the pandemic hitting and um, realizing that a lot of the young people that have stayed in touch with me were in total distress, right? When the pandemic hit, which really shook me because they go through hard times all the time. Like they go through situations that you wouldn't even imagine, right? And, and they're not seemingly not phased by it, right? And then the pandemic hit and they were all shook to their core. Um, so just, uh, uh, and it started with just me and one of the youth, Jacob, and we started driving around uh, providing peer support, spending our own money to get supplies. And then other people pitched in, including organizations like Parkdale Food Center and Operation Come Home. Um, and so, yeah. So we spent the whole pandemic just trying to support each other, uh, trying to support people with material supplies, but more so than that, just peer support as well. And just sort of having this community of people that you already always hopefully know that somebody is there for you. I would hope that the youth that know me, and I think they do know this, know that they can call me at any time. And even if I can't help them, I will, if I'm available, answer the phone. And if not, somebody else in the group will. Th thank you so much, Charlotte. I, 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 we've been following quite a bit of your work uh, with the Live X Alliance, and, and I think it's incredible that, that you were able to build a community uh, like that. And, and what a, a fabulous way to have you know, that peer support and that peer connection. And I know that goes a long way. Um, um, here's a, a question. Um, um, the pen well it's actually I'll, I'll go back a little bit for, for before i ask that question what is the biggest misconception that uh you notice people hold about youth uh, experiencing homelessness i know you talked a little bit about this but briefly if, if you can talk, speak to that yeah i think one of the big misconceptions is that uh these are bad kids and i know that's like so simplified but, and it's been said so many times before but that really is what people think right and especially then um you know, they're not obviously bad kids, but to be honest, they have a lot of challenging days, right? And so sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll meet a youth and they're in, like they're having a really challenging day and your perception is that, okay, this, this young person is aggressive or violent or they don't, they don't want help. Look, I can see them being offered help and they just don't want it. People ask me all the time, you know, there are supports for help, but you know, youth aren't using them. How can we get them to, you know, use these supports? And um, I don't always know the answer, but um, I do know, I know for a fact, and maybe it's not because of statistics, maybe it's just because I know it in my, you know, like heart, but I know that young people do want help and they don't want to be where they are, 
But I also know that when they are suffering and when they are struggling, they will, one of the ways that they cope with that is sometimes to act as if they don't care and just to, you know, to tell people to F off and this kind of thing, because um, when you're in that position and when you have nothing and you feel like nobody cares, you can either sit there and, and believe that you're a loser, or you can say, actually, I'm not a loser and I don't care about you. I don't care about you. I don't need you. I don't need anything from any of you because that's just the only way to protect yourself in that moment. And people don't understand that, that what they're seeing, that person telling them to F off is, does not mean that that person doesn't need help or doesn't want help. It just means that they're, they're not ready for it in that moment. And the reason they're not ready isn't because their fault at all. It's because of our whole system and the way we have set it up for people to fail yeah. and for people to be blamed. And after you've been blamed so many times for something that isn't your fault, you just don't care anymore. Or you do care, but God damn it, you act like you don't care. Right. Yeah. At least you feel, yeah, absolutely. So last question, Charlotte. Um, um, can you tell us something that your research has taught you um, that, that, that surprised you in this field? I feel like I've been talking about my research for so long that I don't know what, I, you know, it's, I wish I could just go back and what did surprise me in the beginning. I mean, I, I, sorry, go on. No, go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you, I, I was gonna say, you don't have to go back to it. I know you, you've covered quite a bit. It's, it's hard to go back to those particulars sometimes. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, one thing that surprised me, honestly, when I was started hearing young people's stories is just how frequently the things that happen to me are happening to other people too, right? And that includes like things that are really awkward and uncomfortable for us to talk about, things like incest, uh, childhood sexual assault, um, things like going through the foster care system and having those people who are paid to take care of you uh, turn around and abuse you. Um, so that that really shocked me in kind of a, a really depressing way, but also in a weird way, it kind of comforted me because I realized like that was the first time me realizing, wow, this, these things that happened to me weren't my fault because I could see in the young people, like I would never sit across from a young person and go, oh, well, yeah, that happened, but you made this choice before that. So maybe that's your fault, you know? But certainly reflecting on my own past and growing up as a teenager who was being told, you know, who was being sus uh, suspended, you know, all kinds of things, uh, you know, being put in jail, thinking that all of these things were my fault. Um, that really changed me when I started research and I started hearing from other young people. It made me really sad, but also, yeah, in a weird way, it, it gave me that comfort of knowing, wow, this is happening all the time. Like this is happening all the time, you know, amongst all of us in, in every class, in every profession, in, every, you know, all kinds of families. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, your sexuality, these things are happening. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and you know, you, what you said is interesting that after all these years, they keep happening to people. And I, I think that that's, that's disheartening in, some, in many ways. Now, I have, I, I said that was the last question. I have one last one, and, and this will probably be a short answer for you, but the, the pandemic, as you know, has been uh, brutal for in many ways, but has also seen some important innovative um, ideas and approaches come into play. Um, you just talked uh, one that you were involved. What are some things happening in response to the pandemic that we cannot stop doing? And we need to continue funding and supporting. Um, I actually don't know. I mean, I, I like, you know, I would say like the, <laughs> I don't know what, what we've started doing that we should keep doing, but I know things that we should have started doing a long time ago and we still aren't even in the pandemic, right? Which is one huge thing is the, you know, um, young people who are accessing OW, right? Ontario Work Social Assistance, like it's not enough money for them to survive, you know? It's ensuring that these young people have to inevitably at some point um, commit fraud, basically, right? You're gonna have to work under the table. You're gonna have to misclaim things because the amount of money the government gives you is not enough for you to actually pay your rent and buy groceries, right? Let alone the fact that on OW, it's, you're not getting provided with things like dental care, like you know extensive dental care, right? Which matters to things like our mental health, our sense of identity you know, uh, how confident we are and all of our actions and behaviors that are associated with those things, right? 
So I don't know. I mean, I saw during the pandemic, obviously, serve checks going out for two grand, but I didn't see those being um, advertised to young people and to people in extreme poverty, you know, the people who really need them, whereas they could have been. This could have been a time to make that happen and to make that the standard. Right. Well, the guaranteed basic income model, right? I, again, pe people need basic um, necessities at least to be covered for, for them to, to, to thrive, to even recover. Uh, I've seen, pe I've seen, I guess I've seen one thing I've seen more since the pandemic is some of my friends, older friends, not youth, getting access to safe supply, right? So get being, being provided uh, a prescription for uh, opioids, mm -hmm. um, for safe opioids so that they can access those things as opposed to buying street fentanyl and risking, uh, you know, overdose. But again, it's not enough and it's, it's just not enough and it's too little too late and people are still having to lie to access those services, you know, and doctors are knowing they're lying to access those services. Um, so it just becomes a culture of turning a blind eye in order to save some people. But does that really affect change in the long run when none of us are willing to admit that we're having to use these shysty methods to navigate a system that is so rigid and inflexible that's letting people die? Charlotte, you um, have really uh, opened our eyes today and, and, and into some of your, you know, your, your thoughts and, and experience. Um, so thank you so much for handling those questions. And, and we were very glad to have you uh, join us and, and um, give us you know, that, that broad sense of experience and, 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 and work in the community. Uh, so thank you so much. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, once again, a, a huge uh, shout out to our program sponsor, Tech Savvy, for making this event possible. And before we go, a, remind, a reminder to check out the brand new website, gennextEO.ca, and sign up for the newsletter. The link is dropped uh, in your chat uh, right now. A and finally, if you are able to make a donation to, to Gen Next, know that your support is so appreciated. When you choose to support our work, you're providing opportunities for youth to build safe, safer and brighter future. We hope to see you all later this afternoon at the Gen Next virtual networking and happy hour event with Top Shelf Distillers. It's a great chance to meet the team and ask questions about the, ne the new Gen Next East Ontario. Also don't forget, also don't forget we have two more speaker sessions lined up for tomorrow. Liz Clark, will be here to talk about empowering youth in our communities. And we will also be hosting a panel discussion about inclusion and employment for all spectrums of diversity. The link to join will be in your inbox. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>